Hands are one of the most complicated regions of the body to learn. In this video, I'll walk you through the muscles of the hand, hand movements, the major arteries of the hand, and the nerves. After you watch this video a few times, you'll be much more comfortable with the hand, and you'll be well equipped to be able to ace your exams. All right, let's get started. Okay, so here's our model of the hand. Here we've got the palmaris longus tendon, which leads us into the palmar aponeurosis right here. Now that the palmar aponeurosis is removed, we'll have an easier time visualizing the intrinsic muscles of the hand. We'll start with the three muscles of the thenar eminence. The first one is the abductor pollicis brevis. The abductor pollicis brevis will abduct the thumb, which looks like this. From the side, abduction of the thumb looks like this. I'll turn the model for a better view of the flexor pollicis brevis. Flexor pollicis brevis will flex the thumb at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. The third thenar eminence muscle is under here. It's the opponent's pollicis. It inserts onto the first metacarpal to pull it up and over. This is opposition of the thumb, or movement of the thumb to the opposite side of the hand. Having opposable thumbs allows us to hold tools, one thing that separates us from other species. Another muscle that will aid in gripping is the palmaris brevis. It sits right here, on top of the hypothenar eminence. When it contracts, it pulls on the skin to accentuate the hypothenar eminence. This will make the palm deeper to allow us to hold things better. On this side we have the hypothenar eminence. We have abductor digiti minimi manus, which will abduct the little finger. The flexor digiti minimi manus will flex the little finger at the MCP. This usually brings the ring finger with it. I'll tell you why that's so in a little bit. Stay tuned. Under here we have the opponent's digiti minimi. It attaches to the fifth metacarpal to bring it forward, helping with opposition of the little finger. Next we have the lumbricals. They attach from the flexor digitorum profundus tendons to the dorsal digital expansion, or dorsal hood. We have an easier time seeing these muscles if we take the plate off and flip it over. Here you can see these muscles attached to the flexor digitorum profundus tendons. When the lumbricals contract, they'll position your hand in the shape of an L, where the MCPs are flexed and the pips and dips are extended. Here we can see the transverse head and the oblique head of the adductor pollicis. It attaches to the proximal phalanx to adduct the thumb, like this. And again from the side, this is adduction of the thumb. These muscles are the palmar interossei, which attach to the metacarpals. In palmar interossei, adduct, or adduct. On the back of the hand, we can see part of the dorsal interossei peeking out from between these tendons. We can see the first dorsal interosseous muscle really well over here. You can see the fibers run in this direction, so when it contracts, it'll pull the first metacarpal this way. In general, the dorsal interossei abduct the fingers, dab. But remember, the fibers of the first dorsal interosseous muscle will cause adduction of the first metacarpal, not abduction. The dorsal interossei attach to these three fingers to pull them away from the midline of the hand, which passes through the middle finger. They also attach to either side of the middle finger to pull it away from the midline, which, by definition, is abduction. As we saw before, we have the tendon of the palmaris longus muscle. It's been cut and removed so we can see the structures underneath. The palmaris longus flexes the hand at the wrist. If we flex the wrist against resistance, we can see the tendon pop out, if it's present. It's missing in about 15% of the population. This right here is the flexor retinaculum. It functions to hold down the flexor tendons at the wrist. If I turn the model to the side, we have a better opportunity to see the flexor pollicis longus tendon, which goes to the distal phalanx, and flexes the thumb like this. These tendons here, passing through the palm and into the fingers, are the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis. These tendons do an interesting thing. They split and attach to the middle phalanges, allowing for the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus to pass through and attach to the distal phalanges. Back here we see the tendons of extensor digitorum. From here these extensor digitorum tendons will pass into the fingers to extend them. 
Here we have the intertendinous connections. This intertendinous connection between the last two extensor tendons is what's responsible for us not being able to flex our pinky without having our ring finger flex at the same time. If you hold your ring finger down while flexing your pinky, you can feel that your ring finger wants to flex too. This makes it difficult to use these two fingers independently from one another. Here's a fun fact. Some professional pianists have the intertendinous connection cut so they can use their ring finger and pinky separately. I've positioned the model to the side like this so we can see what's known as the anatomical snuff box. This right here on my hand is what the anatomical snuff box looks like. The term comes from many years ago when people used to place powdered tobacco, or snuff, in this depression before they inhaled it. I guess I kind of used it as a measuring spoon. The snuff box contains an important bone, the scaphoid bone. Pain in the anatomical snuff box may indicate a scaphoid fracture, which is a serious type of fracture. The anatomical snuff box is bordered by three tendons. The first one wraps around Lister's tubercle for leverage and runs up into the thumb. This is the extensor pollicis longus. On the other side we have the extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. Now the abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and extensor pollicis longus, and the extensor indices are all part of a group of muscles known as the deep distal four. On this side, we have the extensor carpi ulnaris, which attaches to the base of the fifth metacarpal. Next, we have extensor digiti minimi. Here are the tendons of extensor digitorum. Here we have extensor indices. Here we have extensor carpi radialis brevis, which attaches to the base of the third metacarpal and the tendon of extensor carpi radialis longus, which attaches to the base of the second metacarpal. Holding all these tendons down, we have the extensor retinaculum. This is the ulnar artery. It passes into the hand to create the superficial palmar arch. On this side we have the radial artery, branching into the superficial palmar branch to contribute to the superficial palmar arch. Branching from the superficial palmar arch we have the common palmar digitals, which branch into the proper digitals in the fingers. The radial artery passes to the back or dorsum of the hand. It's going to dive deep through a little gap between the two heads of this first dorsal interosseous muscle. When it comes through the heads of the adductor pollicis on the other side, it'll pass across the metacarpals to form the deep palmar arch. Going back to the ulnar artery, we can see that it has a deep palmar branch. It passes between the abductor and flexor digiti minimi to contribute to the deep palmar arch. The radial artery gives off the superficial palmar branch, passes to the back of the hand to pierce the first dorsal interosseous to become the deep palmar arch. And then we can see the dorsal carpal branches on this model. These are the branches of the medial branch of the median nerve, after it passes through the carpal tunnel. These branch off the lateral branch of the median nerve. What the model doesn't show is the median recurrent nerve, which runs superficial to innervate the thenar muscles. This is an important nerve to know about because if someone happens to acquire a laceration in the thenar region, the median recurrent nerve could be severed, which would compromise proper function of the thumb. So all these branches come from the median nerve which passes under the flexor retinaculum through the carpal tunnel. Now these individual branches of the median nerve are called proper digital nerves. You can see that they all run into the fingers. Over here we have the ulnar nerve. We can see the cutaneous branches here. There's a branch that's going to dive deep to supply the deeper muscles like the adductor pollicis and palmar interosseae, to name a few. Now, if we turn the model to the side here, we can see a posterior branch of the ulnar nerve. The branches of this supply the skin on the back of the ulnar side of the hand. 
On the thumb side, we can see the radial nerve in its branches. There's a lateral branch right here, and there's a medial branch right here. Both supply the skin on the radial side of the hand. Here we've got the collateral ligaments exposed so we can see them. Holding down the flexor tendons, we can see that we have annular ligaments and cruciate ligaments, annular ligament and cruciate ligament. They act as pulleys for the flexor tendons. There's also a synovial filled bursa that wraps around each tendon to allow for easy sliding of the tendons when the fingers move. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider clicking like and subscribing to my channel. Don't forget to turn on notifications to get alerted to all my latest videos. For more helpful anatomy and physiology study resources, visit www.humanbodyhelp.com.